G'day guys, welcome back. Episode 39, Money in the Tank. We've got uh, Brad back off the off the deathbed with uh, a crooked neck. Maybe too much lying lying down when you were sick, Brad. And, uh, up yesterday, damn it. <laughs> and uh, Arnie as well. So uh, without further ado, Joel Seach, Principal Advisor, Harp LFG. And Arnie, Tax Professional. And Brad, Startup Founder and Generalist. Yes, and if you want to get us, it's at Money in the Tank on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please leave a like, comment, subscription, or, you know, question. We love the Q&A, or a 50-50, and we'll throw it in the mix. We had some in the good, comments lately, so please. Uh... We had some good feedback from last week's 50-50 sixth uh, sense, didn't we, Arnie? Which uh, you'll be able to tell the listeners all about where the, where the uh, ratings went. Yeah, six cents. I got to tell you, it was a surprise to me. I might just tell you now. Everyone's firmly in the number three camp, which surprised me, Jolly. So they're all on board with you. I thought three was a bit light on, but you know. Now, well, I didn't see an option for none. What were you, Brad? Oh, yeah, none. Yeah, you were none. Yeah, that was um, like one of those non Aussies. Oh, I guess, no, Vegemite for you, Brad. Sackers, no, I got no. My, I used to hate it so much. I think it's because my sister, like, she would torment me and she would, like, <laughs> literally say if I was making some toast or something, she was going to put peanut butter or jam or whatever. She'll just layer it with gem, Vegemite and then put whatever spread on top. Oh, into it and I just lose my mind. So, uh, yeah. That's brutal, man. Bad Wish, times. Bad oh, times. You're a Marmite guy. <laughs> no, nothing. nothing. Oh, we might, uh, Brad, we might get you just to quickly check your mic. A little bit faint today, mate. We want to hear your loud, lovely voice. You said um, that to me. And, uh, yeah, so yeah, the uh, great feedback from everyone. So we'd love to hear where everyone's at. I think uh, my missus was number two, um, which was a bit light on for me, but I felt like three was probably, the spread wasn't really good in there. I, I felt like they were a bit clumpy with it, but yeah, overall, but very uh, hot topic. Very hot topic. I, I can't believe I'm the only one that likes a four or above, like the smothered with butter as well. But anyway, so you, onwards and upwards, you got Rivkin's Rules handy, Jolly. Yep, and we've got a good 50-50 for today. So hang around for that one. Uh, in the office today, but did remember to bring the book, uh, the book of the gods. Yes, um, good man. So uh, let's have a look. We've just got one on this page. Renee's favourite Rivkinisms. Uh, if you don't like it here, leave. Oh goodness, that's uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> um, leave. That is actually okay. Well, you know, I'd say that's being applied to. Uh, and Jolly, how's the sound now? Good, better. Much better. Right. Chris it's, it's not often that I have to turn off a microphone in my life, but um, <laughs> <laughs> seeing my voice and my nickname is Loud Voice. Yeah, we used to be um, called LV1 and LV2, LV2 back in high school, yeah. True. But uh, I think that Rifkin's is applicable at the moment to uh, a lot of articles I'm reading about uh, companies, most recent one being Kraken, uh, where it's basically like, if you don't like it here, leave. See you later, Wokeness. And that's you know, happening more working, and more and more. Working from home fights, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was one with uh, it was uh, Elon drinking Elon, out. Elon a couple of months ago. I think we might have mentioned on the pod, and I've got I've got a mate of mine who listens to the podcast who actually works for Tesla. But um, he did get an email with the three step uh, philosophy from Elon in terms of uh, you know if, if you don't like it, uh, you know go to your line manager. If you're not happy with the outcome, something else. And then if that doesn't work, see you later. I think it's yeah. the return. It was the return to work, return to the office policy. I think it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah I just, it's just, just a number of uh, other companies are coming through with the same thing. Um, even Netflix, of all places, kind of sent around an email saying that, because, you know, um, and Spotify saying that if you don't like working here, there's other places you can go work. <laughs> so, was, that to do, was that to do with the return to work policy, Brad? No, it was all to do with, like, the wokeness stuff. So, like, you know, banning of material, getting yep. rid of Joe Rogan, Netflix, you know, different, different stuff. And it's like, well, this is what we are as a company. And if you don't... <laughs> If you don't like it, there's always yeah. other companies you can go work for. So, um, just, just on a side note with Netflix and Spotify, I guess, and the cancellations of everything is I watched a really good one with uh, comedian Dave Chappelle the other day that spoke about art and how um, the latest one, it was him um, just doing a, a stand, not a stand up, it was more of a Q, not a Q and A, it was just an acceptance speech for the, the School of the Arts that he went to about them naming the hall after him. And he spoke a lot about art and he spoke about how. Um, it shouldn't be cancelled and it shouldn't be falling into the work culture, which is a, an argument for a different day. But I, I think it was really interesting to to hear him talk about how art um, how art should be accepted and, and what it's what it is for. So, um, but anyone out there listening uh, listening that wants to watch that, I think it was a really good one on Netflix. Interesting. There you go. Not just financial uh, advice here. Just, uh, oh, we, we, we touch on not, we not touch on all aspects, all aspects, all aspects of, of life. life. All right. <laughs> Anyway, let's, what's our main topic for today? Brad, you can lead us in. Yeah, look, I think um, I think the pictures of uh, some, some protesters or the, the general public in Sri Lanka 
raiding the presidential and prime minister grounds and swimming in the swimming pools and having showers in the shower and, and everything kicking off in Sri Lanka um, has, has kind of sparked a number of bits of analysis that I've been kind of reading. I mean, it's something that I've been interested in for a while, and I know that I spammed this into the group about emerging economies in giant China and what's going on in Sri Lanka and, and that stuff. Um, but I think it's just brought it to the forefront. And I also I was kind of building out a bit of a uh, Brad Santabono um, <laughs> episode on Sri Lanka. And I thought, hey, why not just mix the two together? Yeah. And so we're, um, we're going to do something kind of similar format to the oil, but um, where we're going to just run through the timeline of, so that all the tankers out there can understand and what you're reading in the newspapers at the moment around Sri Lanka and you know, debt prices and stuff. You can understand where it's come from um, and with how we got to the current state of play, because I think it's always, as we said with oil and the rest of it, it's just another one of those variables to kind of understand the data points and, and things that occur so that you can kind of look to the outlook and kind of form, you know, utilise the information to form, you know, your forecast and what you think may be coming um, and then benefit from that. So mm. that's what we're going to be doing today. Shall I kick Love in? It. Yeah, jump into it, mate. Like, without right. further ado, let's go. Without further ado, jumping in straight away. All right, can we see it all? Sure can. Yeah, mate. All right. Some beautiful well, pictures. Well, uh, Santa Bono. Hats on. Hat on. Love it. Hat on. Hat on. <laughs> Just resting very, very loosely on top. Um, look, I've been to, I've spent a total of 13 weeks in Sri Lanka. Love the place. Um, first went there in about 2010, 11. Uh, went back 2015, I think it was, 14. Somewhere around there. Um, and picture in the middle is where I do not lie. That's me on top of the rock that you see down the bottom right-hand corner called Sigria. And um, I was sweatier uh, than I am now. And I have about just as much hair, actually a little bit more, but not much more. <laughs> obviously, that's a, obviously started shedding a while ago. Um, and that's my uh, best Sri Lanka mate, Shintaka, um, that I've worked with at the bank. But um, top right-hand corner, you've got Aragon Bay. Bottom left-hand corner, you've got a hotel called Kandalama. It looks like, I know, something from the future where the world's taken back over, but that's kind of the whole point of it. High-end... Uh, hotel in the middle of a national park where you've just got monkeys on your balconies, you've got tigers running in front of you and um, and Sri Lanka. And then we've got top right-hand corner with the tea plantation, which you stayed in, there, which is Hatton. And so it's a tiny little island, but it's got a lot going on in terms of beautiful beaches, lush jungles, deserts, tea plantations in the hills, um, and a lot of national parks. And uh, I think I made 2017 or 18, I made, um, you know, tourism place of the year with Lonely Planet. And kind of was kicking off where tourism makes up about 12% of the country. And so I just started, this was my Santa Bono, just proving that I actually do go to these places and I don't just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I just photoshopped myself over the top. But, that's, uh, <laughs> but um, we're going to jump into, which, uh, which kind of, uh, when I saw some pictures the other day, kind of kicked off the whole idea of uh, this one on the episode, hats coming off, is uh, this. So I saw these pictures of the process Um and a lot of the protests were right near this building down here, the bottom left-hand corner, which is the uh, the Gorface Courthouse, which was an old English building which got turned into some apartments. And I actually know the guy that lives, and I met him, and uh, that dome on top right there at the bottom left-hand corner is actually, uh, when you go into that dome, it's this one up the top left-hand corner. <laughs> so it looks old, old school on the outside, but uh, he got some muralist to uh, paint underwater scene on the bottom on the top of the ocean and when you flick off all the lights uh you turn on uv lights it turns into this kind of underwater scene which is which is pretty nice Very um cool. but that sits on gore face which is in the middle of colombo and this is where all these protests were and so it was just kind of a bit of a juxtaposition kind of of my memory of being there versus kind of what's going on at the moment in uh, in sri lanka and obviously you have them in the uh president's the Prime Minister's pool um, and showers, etc. And I'm sure everyone would have seen that in the news. Um, and I thought today we'll just run through, like we said before, um, how did we get here and a bit about Sri Lanka. So I think the first thing that we've got to probably understand about Sri Lanka, um, whenever we're talking about these stories, I think context is a, a very important thing. Um, but this isn't necessarily uh, unique to Sri Lanka when you're talking about emerging, emerging economies, uh, which is... Uh, sometimes it's a family, sometimes it's a tribe, sometimes it's a clan, sometimes it's a group of businessmen, sometimes it's whatever. Um, but in this case, the family, which is the uh, Rachapatsaka uh, family, they um, 
you have Mahindra, which is was the prime minister until I don't know three four weeks ago, um, and he was the old president up until 2015. Um, you got his brother, who was the military and minister of defence, um, who is now the president. And then you got younger brother, who's the minister of finance, um, building the Sri Lankan kind of you know family run party. Uh, you got the brother in law, who's the you know the general consul. You've got cabinet ministers, portfolio people, you know former navy officers, minister of youth and sport. It's all uh, a little bit closely held uh, yeah. by, by the family, as you can see there. And they've been dominant in Sri Lankan politics since around 2005, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct, 100%. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And um, so it's, it's important to understand that. Um, and with this sort of kind of, you know, let's just say a form of government, uh, it, and especially in emerging economies, corruption breeds. Right? Yeah. And um, the next bit of information probably just be aware of is uh, one is uh, it's not on here, but one is that their currency over the last I think decade has lost 80% of its value. Um, and it's government debt, as you can see here, um, has increased around 2010 to 11 from about five, five bills up to about 15 bill. Um, where today Japan and China are the two biggest holders of debt, uh, equally about 10%, uh, but China obviously taking a lot of that over the 2010, 2015 period, which I'll, I'll run into. Um, so just be aware, countries run and has been run apart from a couple of years, um, four years by uh, by the FAM since 2005 and debt over that period has uh, skyrocketed. Uh, 2009, 2015. Um, so Sri Lanka, for those who don't know, we're in a civil war for, oh, I'm going to get fact-checked on this. Arnie, can you have a look at this while I talk? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they were in the, you had the Tamil, Tamil Tigers and uh, the Sri Lankans, Sinhalese at war. I'm going to say two, three decades. Um, so it, it, the war officially began in July 1983 and ended in May 2009. Yeah. Going on three decades, yeah. just under, just under. And so um, important to know that because the country obviously wasn't really heavily, um, you know, for tourism and in, in, you don't exactly uh, kind of attract tourists and uh, in, in foreign investment if you are uh, in a civil war. And uh, more people died during that civil war than I think uh, Afghanistan, Iraq and Gaza combined. So it wasn't exactly like a, a quiet civil war either. It was quite brutal. And, um, and one of the... Uh, Actually, the earthquake that occurred in, uh, was it Boxing Day 2009, 2008, somewhere around there, 2010, somewhere around there, Boxing Day, that actually caused a, uh, a tsunami to hit the uh, east coast of Sri Lanka, which is where a lot of the um, Tamil uh, Navy bases and where they lived. And so that actually devastated, I guess, one side. And, um, and again, happy to be fact-checked here and uh, anybody in the comments that kind of disagree with me here, but, uh, you know, China at that point in time, came in and uh, provided resources and guns and all sorts of stuff to uh, help the current government in charge to kind of finish the war off. And that's why we saw it finish around about that time. Um, and I guess, you know, during that period, due to the kind of closeness of China and also the family being in charge, um, Sri Lanka tilted towards a pro-Beijing um, forest or pro-China foreign policy due to Mahinda's uh, second term of president from 2010 to 2015. Um, and they borrowed, it was over 5 billion US, but it was more closer to 7 billion. Um, and this was something that I even discussed with my mates in Sri Lanka when I was there in you know 2011 or 12, whenever it was, because um, that money had just been borrowed and was being put to work on uh, broad highways around the country to get it going, infrastructure. Um, so instead of taking 12 hours to get to one side to the other, it would take four hours. Um, you know, they're building a new port, building new airports. They're building a whole new kind of uh, CBD area downtown. Um, and at the time, they were all a little bit sceptical of the terms because the IMF was willing to um, loan money at the time. But that uh, when the IMF, just for the Tankers um, International Monetary Fund, when they look to lend money to a country, they want to ensure that transparency is key and that the money doesn't fall into the hands of certain individuals rather than actually goes to work to where it's supposed to be. 
And so when you are running a country and you are an emerging country and you may want some kickbacks, um, the IMF is probably not the way to go. <laughs> Whereas, um, you know, China at that point in time was kind of around the world and offering debt, um, the same slightly higher interest rates and slightly different terms, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a bit later. Um, and one of the key things that China has done very smartly is not only does the country borrow the money, um, so let's just say they borrowed $7 billion to build all this infrastructure, which is very, very important. Um, it's not an investment into the country of like, here's a bit of money and now go do it. It has to get paid back. And if it doesn't get paid back, they have it securitized so that they can take assets back if they fail of paying back a debt. They have um, basically a cross debt bankruptcy clauses, which means if they fail on one, they fail on all. And the last bit is all that work that had to get done to the roads, to the port, to the airport, et cetera, had to be done by Chinese companies. So they had to hire Chinese construction companies to come to Sri Lanka to, and they had to use the money borrowed from China to pay the Chinese companies to build the infrastructure for them. So it was kind of like a win-win. Uh, but be aware that kind of throughout 2009, 2015-ish, 2014, um, there was a whole bunch of China-backed ports built around the world. I've got that kind of down the bottom to show it wasn't just um, in China. It was part of their broader Belt and Road kind of initiative as well. Anything that on there, boys? Or well, even one, up? even one in Australia, right? Like in Victoria, in particular, there it is. the Belt and Road, and yeah, there I remember hearing about it. And, and Andrew's government was involved. So yeah, look at the little one down there. It's on the map. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a little Australia down there. Um, one, one little tidbit to add in there, Brad, is that I think Sri Lanka has been like in this kind of debt crisis, which I know you're going to touch on in a minute, since like a long time, like since like the 1950s. And the IMF has been continuously involved with them as a country. Same as Argentina, same as so many other countries. And so there is this debt cycle that they go through. Um, but it was actually during 2005 to 2015 that a lot of the government debt down and became more commercial debt, but especially 2005, 2010, actually started getting their, their country a little bit, I would say, outside of the debt cycle. And then it's just gone into the next one, right? And this is one that we're talking about at the moment. And the IMF is a big, you know, I'm not going to say the IMF is perfect at all. Because if you look at Argentina, they've been through 14 debt cycles with the, with the IMF. Mm. So they've gone bankrupt, the IMF restructured their loans, they've gone back in, the terms of the loan, I'm never going to get paid back and it just does it again, right? I guess the difference this time is the emergence of other debt providers and the terms that come along with that, which we'll see right at the end about how it's different this time because they've defaulted and how the usual kind of World Bank IMF step in um, isn't occurring at the moment and why. And we'll, we'll run into that. I guess for the listeners with the terms um, Brad mentioned earlier, the terms are, were they talking about in the... China example of issuing the money is that security, which means that they're Sri Lanka having to provide uh, equity or a fail safe to say if they don't pay this money back, then the, those the China would effectively own that infrastructure or part of, or that's why the terms are different in giving up, giving up terms. Whereas the IMF, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, they probably wouldn't have had terms where they own security or infrastructure, but they restructure. Um, and that, that's where we're, getting i guess with these kind of potential issues that are occurring and um yeah it's a it's a an interesting scenario it is it is and that's why i think it's understanding the difference this time about where things might be heading and mm. that's what we want to kind of point out to tankers so we got 2015 16 uh big news around that point in time was probably around uh the rajapaksa family and mahinda being losing the election um that said, he lost it to <laughs> Serafina, who was like a former loyalist and minister in the in the, his government. So it's not it's like the Malaysian government. It's kind of yeah. like you know, Najib went down, old guy came back, his protege, and then you know, Najib, Najib was the protege, and then the old guy came back, and then you know, it's 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 quite amusing how these things work. But um, they came came back, and um, government came into uh, pledging a re reduction in Sri Lanka's reliance on China. They started looking at the terms and realising things weren't looking too good. Um, they suspended some projects and then they realised money is really hard to say no to <laughs> and they resumed it again. And um, so, you know, this is kind of the city of the future that, that they were kind of building out there, um, Arnie, that I was talking about before. Um, mm. And so... 
we then jump forward to 2017-18, only because a lot of, I want to talk about the rest of this stuff because all the articles at the moment are really only focusing on the you know, last few years, and this has been a this has not been a last few years build up. Um, 2017-18, and so uh, Sri Lanka, a country trapped in debt. Um, and so this is where we started seeing things really start to kind of un- start to unwind. So um, the port cost more than a billion dollars um, and you build in US and um, they couldn't, they couldn't, they started defaulting on payments on the port. Um, so the second article, which is Haban Toda, which was the port, um, Sri Lanka is struggling to repay that money. So I signed an agreement to give Chinese firm a stake in the port as a way of paying down some debt. That's where we start seeing China start to move in a little bit. In terms of deals still being negotiated, but the share price, uh, sorry, the share gives could be as high as 80%. Um, and just to kind of touch on this one, ended up giving a full 99-year lease to uh, Sri Lanka, uh, to the Chinese government. And now India and America believe that it could be used as a defence port in future. Um the massive airport that cost them 307 million US dollars. Um, that airport was built in the hometown of Mahinda <laughs> uh, as a bit of a, um, uh, a showy project and to make his people happy um, down south. But so a sleek international airport just built five years ago at a whooping cost appears to be straight out of Passengers Wild's dream. So why is it a disaster? Uh, the airport is now shut. It had 23,000 passengers for a whole year uh, at, its, at its peak. Uh, two airlines flew out of it. Um, but now this international airport that cost, you know, close to half a bill Australian, uh, shut. Gone. And then um, Sri Lanka, uh, I guess with this starting this tense kind of uh, uh, the economy starting to, you know, get shutters, kind of uh, then started, uh, I guess, flowing down to civilian life and, um, and and religion. And this there was a lot of kind of, you know, Muslims forcing people to convert to Islam and Buddhist sites kind of getting vandalised. And then that went back to kind of, you know, Muslim homes and stuff getting damaged and started kind of, you know, I'll say ratcheting it up in terms of um, the country becoming a bit unstable, which flows on to 2019. Mm. And I think um, this is one that probably everyone remembers, which is um, and I, I, my best mate, Shintaka, um, was over there. So at the time, and um, one of the bombs actually hit one of the uh, restaurant and hotels that we dined at. So it was kind of one of those freaky moments where you pictured it and you kind of knew it and they kind of went through there and it killed 300 people on Easter Sunday. Um, Horrible. Yeah, so that was... Horrid. That was hitting churches, hotels, um, Cinema Grand and the Kingsbury Hotel, both I've kind of been to and the new Shangri-La Five Star Hotel, all in, in Colombo. Um, off the back of that, uh, we had the new presidential elections um, about six months later, I think it was. And uh, got to buy a, the current president, uh, the brother of Mahinda, um, landed in there. And so he kind of ran on a few things. One was to heal the country. And the second one was to, um, you know, political instability and kind of, you know, create a stable um, stable Sri Lanka because tourism got smashed in 2019 because of this, this upflare in obviously um, violence and, and kind of the bombings. Um, and so he got back in on that and also around... Um, making it easier for the everyday Sri Lankan by lowering the VAT rate in taxes, right? Which is an interesting play to do when you're in an indebted country. Yeah. Is reducing your tax base. Um, and he want to reduce it from 15% to 8% and abolish several other taxes, including a 2% nation building tax. Um, and... You know, a little quote down there, the government needed to boost its revenues as foreign debt for big infrastructure projects soared, but instead they pushed through some largest tax cuts in Sri Lankan history. The tax cuts were recently reversed, uh, but only after creditors downgraded Sri Lanka's um, ratings, blocking it from borrowing more money as its foreign reserves sank. Um, that, 
That downgrade made major news because it happened at the time and they were basically saying, well, if you're going to cut taxes, you're already embattled with your debt. How are you going to pay or even refinance your debt? So when those credit rating cuts happened for Sri Lanka, it effectively made it like instantly more expensive for them to refinance, just furthering the problem. Correct. Yeah. There's a way that um, I think, you know, for the tankers to understand is there's obviously um, some big rating houses, you know, Finch and Standard Poor's and these sort of ones that uh, basically rate companies, but they also rate countries. And yep. um, I think, you know, Australia is still AAA, I think, maybe. One of the only, what are we, Arnie? Are we? I think we're I'm, close to, I think we might have been downgraded, maybe. Did we get downgraded, did we? Well, I think I think I think the country might be AAA still, but I know the Victorian state Victorian government is not. We got, we, we got downgraded in Victoria. We did, yeah, Victoria, but I think Australia is still one of the only countries that's AAA. Yeah, don't fact, don't fact check us. Uh, you know, we can always fact check ourselves, aren't we? You can fact check live. Carry on, I'll, I'll carry look. on. <laughs> um, but basically, um, as your grade goes down. <laughs> the cost of borrowing goes up and the people who are going to lend money to you uh, goes down. So it's yeah. just like being a person, having a bad uh, having a bad credit rating. I can confirm Australia is still AAA. Nobody worry. Buzz. <laughs> Buzz. All right. So then we, we jump into uh, 2020, 2021. The Rona. The Rona. But uh, first of all... Uh, the Roger Pax's family's kind of party won the election in 2020. So it wasn't just the president, the whole party came yep. in 2020. Uh, Sri Lanka started just loving the new, <laughs> the printer went brute in Sri Lanka before the printer went brute in uh, the US. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Sri Lanka is not a, uh, a world currency that's used by the US dollar. So uh, inflation started going up. Uh, quite radically. Um, Sri Lankan tourism during COVID uh, got a double whammy, right? And you've got that kind of graph down the bottom there in purple showing uh, where tourism and how much it was kind of bringing in total um, total revenue um, into the economy. And then you saw where it would have gone if, you know, the, the COVID and the bombings didn't occur. But you saw the bombings took it down to here and then uh, COVID came along and just <laughs> yeah. finished him. Um, it was a fatality. Um, and then the last the last bit of uh, news that people may or may not have known is Sri Lanka's government uh, plunged into organic farming. So they wanted to be the, uh, the only country, or first country in the world to be pure organic in its, uh, in its farming. And uh, it put in, <laughs> it brought in a, uh, a government campaign and legislation that all farming must be organic and gave no time for farmers to uh, prepare for it. And then they were uh, shocked at the uh, the yields and the spiraling prices and that on top of COVID and everything else. And they pulled it after only seven months. Um, but the farmers that were like, it's already kind of affected the crops and the rest of it. So so agriculture, which is a um, you know big part of their economy, also got its absolutely smashed. And so you could call... The lowering of taxes, the printing of money, the smashing of organic stuff, all stuff that didn't necessarily need to happen. It was actually uh, a full ban. They did a full ban on yep. any chemical fertilizers. And as such, it crippled the farming industry. Whereas Sri Lanka used to be a nation that was self-sufficient for food supply, is no longer. And because of all the issues you mentioned, mm. Brad, the farmers have decided it's too risky of an endeavor to even try and participate in that, um, in that business. And so it's just compounded the problem even further. And that was, again, that particular um, president that you mentioned, I won't try and say his name, but I remember reading that he, that was one of his most spectacular policy area, uh, policy errors as a government. It shows the risk of knee-jerk reactions, whether it be via government or, or companies, but more pre prevalent governments, make, governments making knee-jerk reaction decisions because you can see if they're tried or, or untested, then you essentially are going in, you know, blind to, you know, and you really, you, you don't have all the outcomes or what the potential pitfalls are. Uh, and then you cause these sorts of things to occur and you get surprised why. And even in Australia on a smaller scale, you can, you can think back to different um, implementations of things that were knee jerk potentially to win government or to win voters or whatnot. But then there's always there's always ramifications of those things that unfold, and sometimes I think um, that 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 can get a little bit 
um, you know, it, it, it can sort of um, cause these issues that, that occur because there's not enough consultation or time frame mm, that goes into key. through things. And for every action, there's a reaction. Um, good policy usually takes time to form, takes time to work through, takes time to consult and work out pros, cons, pitfalls to then implement with some at least form of what's going to occur from it. A great parallel to think of when we think about this, and you can liken it to the Australian market, is phasing out of coal and the phasing out of uh, liquid natural gas or LNG as like, you know, as we move towards renewables, you hear a lot of people say, and I think, you know, possibly naively that we should just stop coal, stop LNG, move to renewables. Just turn it off. Yeah. But like, look, look at what happens when you just smash an industry like that. It has these domino effects. So you need to transition in a smooth, effective and matter yeah. over a longer mid to longer term, as Jolly mentioned. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that comes with age and, and maturity and, I guess, experience of seeing this stuff. Because I used to be, look, I put my hand on my heart 10 years ago. I used to be one of those people just like, I don't understand why our governments are so slow. I don't, I don't understand why our infrastructure takes so long to build. I don't understand why it costs so much. I don't understand why our policies take so long. We're going to get overtaken by, you know, uh, different sorts of government, um, look how fast they're moving, et cetera. And then, you know, you see the flip side. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, it's even something like, you know, the other day, it's as simple as this, but we're driving past some of the new um, underground stations that are getting dug near my house, near uh, Domain Interchange. And Amy's like, how long is this going to take? When's it opening? Oh, you know, in China. And I was like, yeah, look, I used to think like that until I started seeing, you know, uh, the amount of landslides, the amount of tunnel collapses, the amount of sinkholes, the amount of whatever, not being because, you know, the geo surveys and the, the engineering side of it wasn't done to the same level, right? And so yeah. it's like you can get the infrastructure there, but... Is it going to last? So. Yeah, there, there's definitely a, an argument for both sides. Like there's probably a happy medium where it can be sometimes too inefficient with government. Uh, government. Um, but then, yeah, you, you don't want to have the other side of the coin where something's rushed through to appease someone or win voters and there's not enough thought pattern that goes into it. And, and you could probably go back year after year with election promises for different governments where they put something in like, I just kind of mind the pink bats thing from 10 years ago. Yeah. Where, you know, almost crippled an industry and they didn't think enough about it. And there was deaths and there was installations that weren't even going ahead and payments made. And, and that's just a, you know, an example without picking on any government, government, it's good. Either government could have done something like that. I'm sure the other side's probably done it as well many times, but it just something that goes in as a knee jerk to potentially win voters to say, Oh, here's a, an election headliner, but not enough thoughts gone into it. Yeah. And that's perfect. Perfect example. And then um, I guess, you know, What's happened this year, and people are probably more uh, more kind of aware of what's happened this year, but uh, a couple of points. We've got the inflation. Inflation hits 20%. It's actually more like, you know, retail inflation. Sorry. I mean, total inflation I saw the other day was more like 60%. Yeah. Um, you know, state emergency, cabinet resigns. Um, another one of the president's brother, the prime minister, continues on, which is Behinda. Um, social media bans came in. Um, work started going on strike. Mahinda, um, which is the old president, resigned on the May 9th, so not only a couple of weeks ago. Jeez, a couple of months goes like crazy. Um, let's just say a lot more pressure gets put on the new, <laughs> when they say new, uh, Neil, he's actually been the Prime Minister five times before. He's not, <laughs> the, uh, he's not he wasn't any new blood getting put into the uh, equation uh, tankers. Um yeah, you know, a month later, he says completely collapsed. Uh, they don't have enough money to uh, basically pay India for a lot of the petroleum they're bringing in from India. Uh, inflation expected to hit sixty percent. There you go, bang. Uh, that's what I was talking about before. It actually has hit sixty percent. Uh, curfew, and then obviously we get back to where we started, which is uh, people jumping in pools and uh, and um, you know showers and, and and kind of asking for a change prime minister says i'll step down i think the president maybe in the last 24 hours is saying they're going to step down now we're going to step into this a little bit yeah well it is i think while you're looking at this slide tankers part of the um part of the imf negotiations has sort of required that a functioning government be in place for sri lanka so once those two uh, prime minister and president positions are you know, they step down and then someone's slotted into them, then they can resume trying to work out how to get out of this mess with the IMF. Right. So that's, that's the likely course of action. Uh, the previous slide, I guess, with inflation, we've said it numerous times on the podcast, is that's the reason why you don't want inflation in that top left-hand side there. And then July 5th uh, and the right-hand side there is 
cost of food, people are going without meals. Um, you know, inflation it, it, at its worst uh, is a very bad thing, which you can see occurring here, um, you know, linking into the printing of money, linking into uh, minimizing taxes, defaulting on loans, taxes, defaulting on loans, et cetera. Uh, inflation, you don't want to have that occurring because that's where, it, at its worst case, it causes this kind of unrest and state of emergencies, et cetera. 100%. 100%. Um, so just talking about this one, we talked about, I mean, the IMF at the moment, I've been talking, obviously there's a bunch of mates that are, um, that are Sri Lankan. Can you see that? Yep. Awesome. Um, so these are just some pictures from my mates in Sri Lanka at the moment. And um, that's where the protests were, but that's kind of like the day before. And so this is Colombo, everyone. Uh, this is, I don't know what the population of Colombo is. Um, but it does seem like it currently is a uh, an absolute ghost town, which is crazy because its population is actually, you know, uh, I don't know what the population of it is, but talking about millions and millions and millions and millions of people in an emerging economy kind of capital city. Um, it's a ghost town because they can't get petrol, they can't go anywhere, they can't go to hospitals, they can't, they can't do anything. And that's where inflation, inability to pay your bills and stuff, this is, uh, this is where it can get to, which is kind of... You know, uh, was that Sri Lanka or Colombo? Was that Melbourne last year? Uh, that was Sri Lanka, Colombo, right in the last week, those pictures were. Uh, Melbourne last year from COVID. Just joking, yeah. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Sorry, Jolly, I was in the US. Um, so Chinese debt contracts. Uh, this is out of a new report that actually um, came out, and I'll, I will I will link it with uh, Arnie in the description. This was a very, very interesting report to go through. But it went through kind of where China's been lending money, which is that kind of figure one, figure three, um, kind of talks about the kind of countries. I guess you can get that from figure one, but, mm. uh, you know, it's, it's all it's that kind of lower middle income, upper middle income, not really high income countries. Um, figure seven is a problem for the IMF at the moment, which hasn't ever been a problem in the past, which is a use of confidentiality clauses in Chinese contracts over time. So they started it, you know, back in 2008, 2010, and then 2013, 14, got a bit more hardcore into it and then have been ever since every single contract they've written has confidentiality clauses in it. And what that means is that when the IMF comes along and says, okay, let's do a restructure, what loans and debt do you have in place at the moment? Let's have a look at the terms. And this China gives uh, authority to those contracts can't actually be shown to the IMF and other organisations. So it's very hard to be able to provide debt to a country without understanding the, I guess, the terms of the debts they're currently in. Um, an example could be you provide $6 billion in emergency funding and the contracts of the term meant that they have to pay back anything that is owing to them from any money revenue source that they have. And so that money goes straight to China. Right? It doesn't actually go to where it's supposed to be going around humanitarian aid and the rest of it. At the moment, China is excusing themselves from all debt conversation to do with Sri Lanka, um, which is just an interesting geopolitical play at the moment. I'm not saying who's right, who's wrong, you know, anything like that, but it is definitely a um, geopolitical play between your India, your um, US and China around Sri Lanka's importance in where it is in the world. Um, because basically the, they call it the diamond in the string of pearls um, as a part of the Belt and Road. And it's right uh, where a lot of shipping <laughs> goes, about to go through the Strait of Malacca and the rest of it. So uh, that's one other kind of thing to be aware of in a lot of these emergency economies that have borrowed money from China or other countries. Looks like confidentiality clauses are getting in there um, and security arrangements. And so um, as you can see here, Joel, what you were talking about before, um, generally bilateral um, creditors, kind of like IMF and stuff, or multilateral creditors, hardly ever have any sort of securitization on, on loans. Um, whereas the Chinese Development Bank, about 75% of all their loans have security written into them against, you know, future income of those, those things, future payments, and then therefore... Um, so if, the, if it isn't obviously generating the revenue and the income that it's supposed to be and they can't pay back the debt, then it defaults and they actually have security to take back those assets or, you know, install various things. And assume control and management of them. You, you'd Correct. Um, I think this is one in this report that was really, really interesting that I thought explains it really simply. 
to the tankers about how this works. Um, so this was Ecuador and um, China Development Bank's 2010 oil backed loan to Ecuador. Um, so the Chinese Development Bank led let money, one billion loan facility to the Ecuador Ministry of Finance. And China put the money into an account, which is this one in the middle. And their deal was also at the same time, um, had an agreement that PetroChina was allowed to have a certain amount of barrels of oil per day to come from. So they secured, I guess, um, supply of oil from Petro Ecuador. And the oil sales and purchase contract of, uh, of that oil every day. Uh, the money goes into the same account that Ecuador is supposed to be paying the money back to the lender. So if the money isn't paid back to the lender, then they can utilise the money that the contract says they have to provide them oil each day. And instead of them paying for the oil, they can just take that money back from the interest that was supposed to be done. So this is a way of kind of securitising. And look, some people will look at this and go, well, that's just commercially sound, like, you know, if you're lending money, you need it securitized. We have to put up our houses and the rest of it. That's good. But it's just not how a lot of the loans and the loan terms, et cetera, um, are generally done to emerging economies because there is a high risk of default in these countries. But um, just be aware that they're, they're more commercial loans rather than kind of, you know, IMF development kind of development loans. And I think that's kind of just important to, to understand. Um, and last but not least, and I guess, you know, the emerging economy side, um, this is a whole bunch of data sources um, that got put together. And, um, you know, from IMF to Bloomberg to a whole bunch of stuff. And this kind of just looks at uh, the yield of government debt, the, the spread, interest expenses, government debt, and sovereign debt vulnerability rating. Um, I'm not going to go into how, how this is rated. It's kind of down here, the methodology. But... Uh, you know, you could either say top 20, top 15, or top 10. These are the countries um, that are, you know, El Salvador, Ghana, Tunisia, Pakistan, Egypt, Kenya, Argentina, Ukraine, obviously. Uh, but you can see Ukraine's not the worst. Um, now we have Brazil, South Africa. So these are, you know, South Africa, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Ukraine, Kenya, Egypt, Pakistan has like 100 and something million people. Uh, El Salvador, you're talking about a lot of the world's population just in those countries. They're not like, you know, 5 million person countries. And so there's just something to be aware of around where countries are at the moment. Um, a lot of these countries have borrowed money, both from the IMF, um, obviously um, other institutions, countries, but including China. What we're seeing kind of unfold in Sri Lanka at the moment, um, we're seeing kind of similar in Pakistan at the moment on the streets and the rest of the protests. And so it's just something, it's not doom and gloom, it's... Uh, just something to be aware of what's going on around the world, um, understanding how the debt works, understand how countries work. A lot of people believe that countries can, you know, can never really, when they go bankrupt, they just restructure like Argentina's done so many times and kind of just keep going. Uh, but I think, you know, what we saw in Sri Lanka is at least a, goes to show about the how quickly a country can go from, you know, people being able to go to their shops, put petrol in their cars and do that to not. Um, yeah. And just be aware of where, where kind of, that bottom end of emergency economies are because uh, they've got some other big countries down there like uh, Ethiopia, Turkey, and uh, Mexico and Nigeria um, in terms of population and size of economies. Um, so, yeah, that was a excellent presentation. A bit sobering to you know yeah. hear, hear about what's going on, but I mean you have to understand what's going on so we can be informed about what we're going to be what we're going to be doing about it. And yeah, correct. Correct. I mean, it's not always, it's, it's about, you know, it is, it is sobering. It's not exactly nice to, I've got a whole bunch of friends, a whole bunch of good, 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 good friends over there that are, that are struggling at the moment. And it kind of sucks, right? Um, but it's kind of not put your head in the head in the sand. It's about kind of understanding what's going on. And, and sometimes it's just like a bit of a, an example because people kind of give our governments and our, our institutions and regulators a bit of a, you know, spliff in the newspapers and the rest of it. But there's a reason why they take action. <laughs> yeah, a couple, I guess, of high-level thoughts. As I know, the Australian government's had a few uh, stouches with the Chinese government over the last number of years. And, you know, maybe there's some reasoning and rationale around that as to not be pushed around potentially into things they don't want to do. And, um, you know, uh, I guess you've got to always be mindful as to, you know, where the best interest is for your own country and where the interests lie of your people, because that's essentially what it boils down to is they're governing for us. So, um, and then the other thing is taxes as well is, you know, one of the things that jumped out at me in some of the articles I was reading earlier was, 
you know, the, the, the tax cuts that they've done or they, they rescinded on is, is you know, tax is essentially the, the, the livelihood to allow all these things to get done and debts to be repaid and infrastructure to get done. So um, tax is a, you know, is, is a necessity in any country to um, have to pay and people to pay and you rely on intellectual property of people to do companies to make money and pay taxes and then essentially the world goes round and the economy keeps on ticking over so um yeah you know tax is just one of those elements and if uh, people are governments are trying to get in by potentially uh, removing all these taxes it may look good in the short term um but in the in the medium to long term it's potentially not the best thing um tweaking taxes is obviously um, you know, a, a, a way to do things and trying to, you know, there's always arguments to minimise company tax a little bit to help employ people and whatnot, but that's always got to be with um, um, with a, a moderate mindset in place in terms of, you know, without trying not to make things which will cripple. No, spot on, Jolly. I think um, I might jump into the news items just for just to brighten our mood a little bit. Change of pace. <laughs> Say again, mate? Change of pace. Yeah, change of pace. So... I don't know if there's anything, I don't know if there's anything going to brighten our day here so much. It's, <laughs> it's the news after all. But there's uh, anger in Shanghai as COVID returns <laughs> spur fears of a new lockdown over there. I thought the you wife, were spurning happiness here, aren't you? I'm trying to. <laughs> let, let me see if I've got any happy ones written down. I'll, I'll start. No, I'll, I'll just go through them. The White House of Sullivan says that uh, their information is indicating that Iran is preparing to provide Russia with up to several hundred drones. So that's a bit worrying. Press stop. GameStop, sorry, GameStop launches the NFT marketplace. So that's a little bit happy in a way. There's something, something a bit, um, I don't know, not doom and gloom. The White House Sullivan, when asked about oil output, says there's a capacity for further steps that can be taken and that the US will discuss energy security with OPEC leaders on a Middle East trip. Uh, the euro has fallen to a fresh 20-year low of $1.0045 against the US dollar, that is. And then the uh, and then Fed's Bostic comfortable economy can withstand a seventy five basis point increase at the next meeting. Current policy remains accommodative. Action of job market right now does not feel like a recession. So that's from America. Rivian Automotive sales cut to about uh, they're going to cut about five percent of the workforce. And Twitter shares down six point five percent after Elon Musk terminates the deal with Twitter. Did you boys hear about this? Oh yes, <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> indeed, I didn't tell them. Tell the tankers about. Uh, well, Jolly, what have you what have you heard about it, Jolly? Maybe it's going to be a sneaky put option for him. He's just going to come back in now. They got a lower price and just uh, re re offer uh, at a, what is it a thirty percent discount or twenty percent discount to what he originally went in at? Show that meme, money. Show the meme. Yeah, show I the saw, meme. Yeah, I'll show you guys this meme that I had. So let me. I just think share. that summarizes. Well, are you talking about the one where well, the, he posted? Yeah, the one that he posted. So just give me a moment. Um, so here it is, Tanker. So he's basically said, they said I couldn't buy Twitter. <laughs> then they wouldn't disclose bot info. Now they want to force me to buy Twitter in court. Now they have to disclose bot info in court. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, dull. so that's that's that. So do you want to do the crypto roundup or should we just jump into our 50-50 uh, our this week for a bit of levity? What do you reckon? Uh, well, I thought I'd give one nice article, a bit of news that I read Um to like, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, you had Albanese come out that saying Australia could be the renewable energy superpower and power rager off the back of kind of some of the big projects that are going on at the moment. Um, like Mike Cunn Brooks is one with um, uh, the Fortescue Middle Guy um, that's basically going to be powering, sending energy from a huge solar farm in the Northern Territory across to uh, Singapore, and that kind of goes into Malaysia. So that, that was an interesting one, kind of going that um, Australia might become a the ability for to power Asia by 2050 if we kind of you know want to head in that direction around renewables. So there you go. Very interesting. Got to do a positive one every now and again, right? <laughs> and uh, 50 50. We've got a positive 50 50 this week, haven't we? Yeah, 50 50. What was it, Brad? Uh, 50 50 was um, would you rather be rich and famous or rich and anonymous? Oh, I'll straight away say I'd rather be rich and anonymous. I feel like being rich and famous should be hounded. Some people, Once, love, that. Some some people, people love that and some people believe that it also allows them to build a brand and therefore further increase their uh, their their richness and also ability to do things. I Elon doesn't mind a bit of fame. <laughs> Your mate, Elon. I thought you might go with Elon there, aren't you? Well, what, what do you boys reckon? Rich or anonymous or rich or famous? 
Um, it depends what you're trying to achieve, I reckon. I think it depends if you feel like you could leverage off the fame to create more wealth for yourself potentially or whether you feel that remaining anonymous is more important. Um, How about you, Jolly? Um, I think anonymous would probably be, um, you know, I could see pros and cons for both, to be honest. Um, you know, in my line of work, a lot of people with wealth, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, confidentiality is the highest, utmost importance to them. And it might be because they're from a, a regional town or area where they know a lot of people or they don't want to be seen as that that person. And, you know, being being famous i think with wealth and you've got to be mindful of this is it can change your whole perception of um you know your friends or your family or judging and, and whatnot just in everyday life so you'd effectively have to change you know if you become famous and wealthy you'd have to a lot of that potentially could change in terms of the circles you run in and and where your friendships or your family were because money can influence and change a lot of things for people and you do see a lot of stories of athletes or whatnot that have got money and then the long lost cousin comes up and asks <laughs> for money or, you know, the friend wants to get money to start this new business venture. Um, so yeah, the anonymity, On loan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The an anonymity could be a very important thing. So I'd probably go with that side of things. What do you reckon, Brad? It's one that we've, we've talked about a few times at Habitat for the founders um, about like, if it ever did get, you know, a nice exit, what, what would we, you know, and we all just, we all said the basically the same thing, which is, we wouldn't want it getting in the papers. We wouldn't want the amount you know, getting out there. Anonymity, leave it up to you to decide kind of what you want to do with your money, right? Um, yeah. You don't want, I think, Jolie's point around, I think it, unfortunately, money um, does change people's view of people and hmm. also does play an impact, which is like, you know, you don't want to be second guessing all the time. Like, oh, I've got a couple of kind of, rather stupidly wealthy people um friends overseas and you see it you see them like living this life where they're not really close with anybody because they're scared that everyone's just working an angle constantly. yeah that's sad um, man it'd be horrible it would be absolutely horrible to be like that so uh, tell, no, them take... they, tell them if they want me if you don't want to give their fortune to me i'll happily take it off anyway. <laughs> i'll relieve them of that burden you're that, you're that kind of guy yeah, um, help me out help me out and i thought uh, i thought like what we could do as well uh you know take us give us an idea but um you know, this was a sobering topic, and um, but alas, open your eyes. Um, how about we the next week or the week after have uh, the flip side? What are we um, What are we excited about? Yeah, I like that. That's what's the uh, What's the, you know, What's the flip side? What's What's the good stuff that's yeah, happening earning, that people need some, to be aware of? Earning, earning some interest on your bank savings. <laughs> yeah, for one, only, only for inflation to erode it away. <laughs> hey, you could have just left that last sentence off there, John. All right, but uh, no, I thought like it would be a good one for us to kind of dig into because sometimes the focus. I don't know. I'm, I'm one of these people. Whenever it comes to economics, geopolitics, the rest of it, I generally look at things uh, either realist or slightly pessimistic. Um, but, you know, there's always the, the flip side of things. And um, I think maybe we should come in with uh, what are we all personally excited about? Optimism podcast incoming. I love it. Glass love half it. full pod. The glass yep. half full pod. That's great. Done. All right, cool. All right, Done. cheers, boys. Cheers. Right. Thanks for Done. the rundown. Thanks for Thanks listening, everyone. Tankers. Where can we get us out again, Arnie? At Main and Tank, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. See and you guys. Leave your comments. Like yeah. and subscribe. Uh, jump in on any of the, 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 the comments or the socials we have. Uh, give us any Q&As you like or any topics you'd like us to touch on. We love hearing from you. And um, yeah, it's great to get feedback on uh, all the things we do in the 50-50s as well. Love the banter. Correct. Jeez. And uh, last, last words, any Sri Lankans out there or people that kind of can say names better than me, please don't just <laughs> don't fire me in the comments. I apologize up front. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> See ya. Yeah. Bye.